two perennial problems are often reinforced during Advent. The first, that God is a procrastinator, especially when it comes to establishing justice, equity, and peace on earth. The second, that on these same subjects, it's okay for us to be procrastinators too. Pious procrastinators to be sure, patiently praying, your kingdom come quickly, and patiently repenting, especially of our personal peccadilloes. Proactive procrastinators to be sure, patiently plastering patches onto the torn fabric of our lives by feeding the homeless, clothing the poor, weeping for the victims of hatred, violence, and warfare. But procrastinators nevertheless, patiently waiting along with all who are victimized by injustice and inequity and live without peace for our procrastinating God to show up and deal, not just with the symptoms, but with the systems that produce such an ungodly situation. Today's readings present procrastination's poster child, Ahaz of Judah. And in the one little word God speaks to him, purges us of procrastination's power. For Ahaz, that one word is Emmanuel. But it's three words for us, God with us, here, now. God is with us now, Isaiah proclaims to Ahaz, as does Matthew in his gospel, as does the church in this and every place as we celebrate the sacraments. God is with us now, and that is good news. It is also a challenge, a challenge to our procrastination because it asserts that God is with us here and now, and therefore, justice, equity, and peace are not to be delayed. Justice, equity, and peace. These are not merely God's desires for us and for our world in some long, distant future. These are God's expectations of us and our world right now. God with us in Jesus Christ challenges us not just to wait, but to act, not just to pray, but to work, not just to feed, clothe, and house the hungry and the homeless, but to change the systems that allow hunger, homelessness, and poverty to continue. God with us in Jesus Christ challenges us not just to weep for the victims of war, but to challenge the systems that make war possible. There is plenty of evidence that God's desire for justice, equity, and peace is still delayed. Ask a sign, Isaiah says to us, as with Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. God does not wait for our response. In the faces of the poor among us, in the embrace, and in the needs of one another, in word, water, bread, and wine, and in the community of the faithful, God gives us a sign. God gives us Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. A scandal, a vision, a hope, a comfort, and a challenge. God gives us Jesus, God signed to the world that neither God, nor we, nor they should wait anymore. Fourth Sunday in Advent, December 19th, 2004.
ask your conscience, ask your conscience, then you must hear without hypocrisy whether you or human are false or true.
confess to you, my God, I have not rightly acknowledged you before. Though mouth and lips call you Lord and Father, yet my heart has turned away from you.
Long ago and far away in another time, when midnights clear and silent nights were few and far between, God's people were listening, straining to hear God speaking. One of them in particular was especially attentive. The Bible describes that one's listening experience. First, there was a wind howling through the wilderness. Then there was an earthquake shaking with a fury the ground on which he stood. Then a flood, then a fire, and then a long, still silence, only silence. And one question, that question, our question, what is God saying? So much has happened in the last year, in the last decade. So much war, so much need, so much wealth and division. So many earthquakes, winds, fire and floods. Too much rain, too much heat, too much personal, private and public devastation. Through each of these, we and the world have been straining to listen, anxiously asking, what is God saying? There has been no shortage of answers or better answerers from every sector, class, ethnicity, and faith telling us precisely what God is saying through war, hardship, personal, private, and communal disaster. That God is flexing his muscles, that God is revealing God's will, that God is decreeing, demanding, and destroying those who do not those who cannot and those who will not hear, believe, or obey this God. That God is on the side of one against the other, of poor and not rich, of Muslim over Christian, over Jew, over Hindu, over Buddhist. That God loves those who help themselves. That there is no God at all. We all have heard these answers and these answerers, and some of us who would be less vulnerable, some of us who are trying to feel more comfortable, have believed what these have said and what we have heard. There was a great wind, broke rocks to pieces, but God was not in the wind. And then a massive earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And next, a raging fire, but God was not in the fire. And after all, a still, small voice. This is the miracle of Christmas, God speaking for God's self, not for one and against another, not with power or vengeance or devastating authority, not as one for some, but one for all. Not as a Christian, Jew, or Muslim, but as any child of earth. God speaking for God's self. In the first soft, fragile, barely audible breathing of a newborn infant child. God, one of us, with us, all of us. The Nativity of Our Lord, Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2011.
When I was a young boy, I wanted to be an astronaut. Quickly, however, I learned that my 2200 vision was a serious impediment to my ambitions. So, since I loved everything about the stars, the constellations, and planets, I poured myself into the next best thing, astronomy. One Christmas, my parents bought me a telescope, which I still have. I spent many a frigid night on my grandmother's porch with that telescope, exploring the heavens. Like so much of life, my grandmother and her porch are now history. And I live in this city where, if you want to see stars, you don't look up. <laughs> but my interest in the skies has never really left me. Rather, it has been reduced to a continued interest in anything that informs me about what, in the last century, we quaintly called outer space and a regular religious re reading of the New York Times sky chart every Sunday. It was there in the New York Times sky chart about 15 years ago that I discovered a remarkable astrological fact related to the Epiphany. In the Northern Hemisphere, between the nights of December 24 and January 6, every year, and only between those two dates every year, two constellations briefly appear in the night sky, one on the northern horizon and the other on the southern horizon. In the north, it is the constellation known as Precipio, the crib, or better, the manger. And in the south, the constellation is known as the southern cross. Thus, for those nights, the vast expansion of the heavens and everything below is bracketed between the manger and the cross. All human life is lived between the cradle and the cross, between birth and death. We also know that this is not linear thinking. We're born, we live, we die. In truth, we experience little births and little deaths each and every day, maybe each and every hour of every day. We experience little epiphanies, and in the joys and sadnesses, the aches and pains, the disappointments and surprises of each day, we experience little birthings and dyings too. In a very real sense, the manger and the cross, birth and death, are the evidential limits of our existence. The message of the Epiphany is this. In Jesus Christ, our limitless God has imposed our limits on himself. The manger and the cross are the signs of Christ's humanity. They prescribe and describe what it means to be one of us. From December 24th through January 6th, the vast expanse of the heavens and everything beneath it are bracketed by two constellations, Precipio, the manger in the north, and the Southern Cross in the south. And every day the sun comes up, and these limits are visible no more. That, too, is the message of the Epiphany, wrapped up and hidden in the child the Magi come to see. For by limiting himself to human life, described between birth and death, the Incarnate One has also hidden the seed for life without limits, without deadlines, without ending. For as rising sun brightens the sky and erases the starry limits, so the rising of God's sun brings the light of his resurrection to bear on each of our lives. The Epiphany of our Lord, January 2nd, 2000.
la huella, la huella, José y María. Por las pampas heladas, cardos y ortigas. A la huella, la huella, cortando campo. No hay cobijo ni fonda, sigan andando. Florecita del campo, clave del aire. Si uno te aloja, ¿a dónde naces? ¿Dónde nace florcita que estás creciendo? Palomita asustada, grillo sin dueño. A la huella, a la huella, José y María. Con un Dios encendido, nadie sabía. Préstenme una tapera para mi niño. A la huella, a la huella, soles y lunas. Los ojitos de almendra, piel de aceituna. Ay, burrito del campo, ay, buey barcino. Que mi niño ya viene, háganle sitio. Un ranchito de quincha solo me ampara. Dos alientos amigos, la luna clara. A la huella, a la huella, José y María. Con un Dios escondido, nadie sabía. A la huella, a la huella, huellita, José y María. Anunciada noche de amor, Dios 
Dios ha nacido, pétalo y flor, paz a los hombres es la vida. Es la noche que prometió Dios a los hombres y ya llegó. Es noche buena, no hay que dormir. Dios nacido Dios está aquí Llegaron ya los reyes y eran tres, Melchor Gaspar y el negro Baltasar, a ropa y te llevarán y un poncho blanco de alpaca real. Llegaron ya los reyes y eran tres, Melchor Gaspar y el negro Baltasar, a ropa y te llevarán y un poncho blanco de alpaca real. Chicos y chinitos duermanse, que ya Melchor Gaspar y Baltasar. Todos los regalos de cara para llegar y al despertar el niño Dios murió de agradecido. Changos y chinos 
Pedro del Mancé, que ya me llora hasta el Baltasar, que no me gana de nada, para jugar, para despertar. El niño Dios muy bien lo agradeció, le dio la miel y el cocho la vida. We need no instruction about ashes this year. We who saw the towers fall, we who have tasted ash and smelled ash, wiped ash, from our faces, our mouths, our eyes, and our clothes. Ashes surprised us then, diseased us, we wore them involuntarily, but we knew what they meant and from whence they had come. How can we wear them voluntarily today? We ought to be at least as uneasy as we were when we wore them back then. We ought to feel at least as diseased. We ought to at least recognize that we our society, our way of life, and all the monuments to our way of life are finite and can be turned to ash in a moment. To publicly and voluntarily wear ashes today is to publicly say no. To all we have heard about ourselves and our nation and our enemies, these past months, and to publicly shout yes to a God who would do something in and through us about that. To wear ashes today says no to all who have labeled us and our way of life wholly good, and them and their way of life wholly evil. For today, in the ancient words of the prophet Pogo, we say, we have met the enemy, and they are us. And we ask God, through our 40-day discipline of Lent, to purge us and transform us, to create in us new and honest hearts. To wear ashes today is to say no, to the incessant message, especially in the past five months, that worthiness equals consumption, and that the only good citizen is a consumer. And to beg to wear ashes is to admit that we and our way of life are consumable, and to beg God not to consume us, but to raise us as the Father raised the Son, and to mold us and our society in the Son's image, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to reconcile the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. To wear ashes today, especially in this city at this time, is to recognize that in the terror and war of these days, we have merely experienced the above water part of the iceberg we have hit, and to commit ourselves to, to examine and comprehend its far larger hidden part. Our task for the next 40 days, and probably for the rest of our lives, is to ask, 
Is this the hour to trample down violence, to deny death any more lives, to refuse false safety in walls and weapons, to beg of you, Lord, courage enough to look at all that is amiss in our world, in our nation, and in us. Ash Wednesday, February 13th, 2002.
Two troubled travelers walking down a lonely road ask their newly arrived companion, are you the only stranger in the city who does not know the things that have happened? Stranger, foreigner, outsider, alien, migrant. Paruikos in the original Greek language. Abraham was a Paruikos when he first came to Canaan. Moses was a Paruikos when he lived in the land of Midian. The children of Israel were Paruikos in the land of Egypt. It is fun and no accident that they call their companion Paruikos, stranger, foreigner, outsider, alien, migrant. Not because that is what they thought of him, but because that is what they thought of themselves. How many of us think of ourselves in the same way? Jesus had two responses for those two troubled travelers and for folks like us, fellow travelers on life's way. Jesus' first response is to remind us of our story, of Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, the children of Israel as well as Cleopas, and you and I, even Jesus himself, who have been strangers and aliens, on our way to somewhere ever since time began. Jesus' second response is even more compelling because it is a tactile, physical response he continues to make with us every Sunday when we find ourselves together toward evening when the day is far spent and he appears to be going further. It is then, it is now, that he truly becomes our companion, the one who shares with us and becomes for us our bread. That's how we know that we, like Christ, are no longer strangers, foreigners, aliens, or outsiders, alone in a hostile world. That's how we know we have constant companions. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Resurrection of Our Lord, Easter evening, April 12th, 2009. Strikes the 
its arms open with a yell. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there are devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered 
because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Syria, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles, and Arabs in our own languages. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another. But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. What, what does this mean? What they are filled with new wine. What does this mean? What does this mean? They are filled with new wine. They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. People of Are we listening? Those devout Jews from every nation under heaven were not particularly interested in listening to a bunch of Galileans, backwoods hicks, uneducated and unsophisticated. Some in the crowd dismissed the women and the apostles long before the Jerusalem Temperance League got their two cents into the story, they are filled with new wine. Why listen to people who aren't as smart as we are? That question echoes down to this very day. Are we listening? In the very act of hearing and listening, this multicultural crowd receives the very gift for which they've come to the city. It is important to remember that that wonderful list of listeners, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and so on, is not a list of the in crowd but of the out crowd, quite literally. These were God-fearers who were allowed to hang around but not come into the temple of God. They were accepted and at the same time excluded. In their hearing came their inclusion, and in their inclusion, the church, 
the community of believers, the communion of saints was born. And in their inclusion, they began to do exactly what our mission statement says we're to do, creatively shape life in the city. Are we listening? After spending the first five years of my pastoral ministry using the pulpit to battle the right wing of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, I promised myself that I would not do that again unless it became clear that this was absolutely necessary. Yet as I read the account of the first Pentecost and the whole book of Acts, and as I think about those God-fearers, the Parthians, Medes, and proselytes, who until that day were allowed to hang around, but were simultaneously excluded from the people of God, who on the day of Pentecost were brought into the church and on subsequent days became deacons and ultimately pastors and bishops in the early Christian church, my mind and my thoughts are driven to those whom our church allows to hang around without being fully included. I'm talking about gays and lesbians, and I must ask, even from the pulpit, and especially from this pulpit. Are we listening? Are we listening to what the Spirit is saying to us through the story of the first Pentecost and through our own experience of full inclusion for gays and lesbians here at St. Peter's. And if we are listening, what are we going to do? Bishop Paul Egertson of the Southern California Synod has listened, and here's what he did. First, he promised to uphold the constitutions of the ELCA, and then he promised his fellow bishops that if he could no longer do that, he would resign. Then he took part in the irregular ordination of Anita Hill, a woman living in a committed relationship with a woman, called by the people of Reformation St. Paul's Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. Bishop Egerton took part in that ordination and then, faithful to his word, resigned as bishop because he can no longer support or enforce not the constitution of the ELCA, but a policy document drafted by ELCA bishops 10 years ago. Are we listening? If so, what will we do? I'll tell you what I've done. I have written to Bishop Eggerson and to Anita Hill. I am going to ask the leadership of this parish to think through with me what we as a parish should do and with whom we as a parish should stand. We do not all agree, yet whether we like it or not, we at St. Peter's are leaders in this synod and in the ELCA, and we are rightly known as a fully inclusive, reconciling in Christ congregation open to all people, regardless of all human divisions. The time has come, it seems, for us to listen to one another, to listen to the Holy Spirit, and then to take our place. Are we listening? Can we listen also to one another? If we listen, we will not hear the sound of Babel, but the voice of Jesus. The voice that speaks to us, not only in words, 
but also in bath and meal and in the community of the faithful. Are we listening? Then this is what we hear. Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. The day of Pentecost, June 3rd, 2001. Today is the last Sunday of the church year. Over the last 12 months, we've seen Jesus gather shepherds abiding in the fields to the repentant thief dying on the cross, promising, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to remind you of them because as Jesus gathers them, embraces them, and enfolds them into his community, he has much to teach us, this community of diverse people and communities as we revel in our diversity in our church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, as it seeks to be more inclusive. Basically, the message is this. In Christ's glorious and gentle rule, there is more to diversity than mere inclusion. Jesus not only embraces and includes diverse and desperate peoples, he also celebrates and holds their unique perspectives as examples for us to follow and as actions worth emulating. A community gathered in Jesus' glorious and gentle rule is not only diverse, it is also respectful of those on the edges and celebrates the gifts evident on the margins. Society then and now works in exactly the opposite way. On Christ the King Sunday, we celebrate a concept, the Lordship of Christ, that we and our culture find most uncomfortable. That's because our normal thought process contrasts Jesus' lordship with our personal freedom. But the gospel proclaims to us that when we confess 
that Jesus is Lord or Christ is the King, we are making not a personal statement, but a social, political, and economic statement. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, not a nation, not wealth, or not personal advancement over the bodies of others. The Lordship of Christ, which embraces diversity and celebrates the marginalized, is contrasted with the rule of the world that creates uniformity and celebrates the powerful. To say Jesus is Lord is to live as if real authority is derived from stooping and serving, not insisting and demanding. And that real leadership is exercised from the nadir of weakness, the cross, and not from the acne of power. A diverse and disparate gathering of people celebrating the gifts of the marginalized, living within the glorious and gentle rule of Jesus Christ, and seeking to lead by stooping to serve is what we are each time we publicly gather to receive God's nourishment. Listen once more as Christ feeds us. Listen once more as Christ gathers us close to himself and to one another. Can you hear what Christ says in the Eucharist? Can you hear what Christ says to you and to your neighbor? Listen, listen. It is the last word you'll ever need to hear him say. Today you are with me in paradise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ the King Sunday, last Sunday after Pentecost, November 21st, 2004.
I guess I better say something. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> Not too much, right. Well, first of all, I, w I want to say uh, <clears throat> thank you to uh, these marvelous musicians and dancers and, and proclaimers and congregational presidents and choir and cantor and musicians, if I missed anybody, and all of you. Um, this is what I hoped would happen, that St. Peter's Church and the church would celebrate who you are, exactly who you are. God's people in this place making a creative difference, it's what you did, and God's people who are one, one, whether you're gay or straight or anywhere else on those spectrums, or whether you are Spanish as your primary language, or jazz, <laughs> or Hungarian, <laughs> we are you are all one, and you are all <laughs> marvelous people because you're God's people and because you really believe all that stuff you heard <laughs> and you go out and do it. I figure 45 years is sort of like tonight. I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels like two hours seven sermons, and one prelude. <laughs> and I wish for all of us, I wish for all of you, the kind of joy that I feel because of God and Christ and you, and you, every one of you, folks from Grace, folks from St. Peter's, folks from Zion, and I have to add one thing, <clears throat> this I may not get through, so just bear with me. <clears throat> you, uh, you, you are celebrating um, our life together um, as God's people making a difference, and you've given me the privilege of being your pastor, um, and that's been wonderful. But there is one other person who has, without pay, been your pastor too. She's only done it for 38 years. <laughs> My wife, Carol. So to all of you, I just want to say, for all that has been, thanks. And for all that will be, yes. Let's eat. Thank you, guys. You're welcome to join me.